Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Anthony Kaufman, as it says on the screen there. Um, I'm a senior programmer at the Chicago International Film Festival. Thanks for tuning in to our Q&A, our virtual Q&A for House of Hummingbird, directed by Bora Kim. Thanks so much for uh, coming all the way from uh, all the way from South Korea, they've come for this uh, Q&A. Um, so um, yeah, we should just get started. We're really um, happy to have with us moderating Christy LaMaster. Um, Christy was on a jury at the festival uh, last year uh, for our international competition. She's a long time friend of the festival um, and a curator um, in Chicago. Thanks so much, Christy. Um, and uh, yeah. Looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Anthony. Hi, everybody. I'm Christy, and I'm so glad that all of you could join us tonight for a Q&A around the really amazing and beautiful movie, House of Hummingbird. House of Hummingbird, um, House of Hummingbird was recognized um, at Tribeca Berlinale and the Busan International Film Festival and showed all over the globe. Um, and it was well regarded for very, very good reason. And um, I can't wait to talk to Zoe and Bora more about um, how they made the film and what it means to them. But first, a little bit about each of them. So this is Bora Kim's first feature, but it's certainly not her first film. Her 2011 short, The Recorder Exam, um, played in many festivals and was recognized by the DGA. Uh, producer Zoe Su Zoe Sua Cho um, was born in Korea, but raised in New Zealand. Um, she is an independent producer and a co-founder of Mass Ornament Films, a transnational independent production and development collective focused on emerging global filmmakers. And she, we were lucky enough to have her presence here in Chicago when she attended the, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for her MFA. So welcome to both of you and thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I have so many questions about this movie because it really hit me right in the solar plexus. Um, I think like for any person who was ever a teenage girl that this movie could probably really like worm its way into your heart and mind. Um, and it's been really well reviewed and um, that sentiment has been mirrored by lots of different critics. Um, so I guess that my first question to you, Bora, is what made you want to delve into this like really sensitive and delicate and transformative time of the teen years? Um, before uh, answering to your question, thank you so much for inviting us and I'm glad to see you all online. Um, uh, the House of Hummingbird, it wasn't like, a screenplay from the very beginning. Uh, it started from my nightmare that I had in New York. Uh, I studied in graduate school in New York and that was my first time being in the US, foreign country, speaking new language. Uh, and I started to have this nightmare, reoccurring nightmare, which is uh, in the dream I was in middle school and I had to go to school for three years. And I knew in the dream I was an adult, but for some reason I had to go to the school. And it felt like a disaster. And every time I walked up from the dream, I was like sweaty and felt so relieved that by the fact that, that I don't have to go to school. But the feeling of relief was strong. And I was, I was thinking, oh, there's something going on. What's going on in this period? I, I might want to revisit this period. And I started to write journal and notes and like dialogue or lines that I remember still from the era. And so in the beginning it was like big chunk of memories and dialogues or like some specific scenes. And then it became into a screen, fictional screenplay in 2013. So actually it, it, it took many years uh, from the first dream to the screenplay because I needed time to like have some healthy distance from my memories and then making the memories and everything into fictional form and like, uh, you know, write or other like fictional episodes. And so it was like a kind of like 
therapeutic journey as a creator. Um, and I thought it was very worth it after I made it. Yeah. And I guess I have sort of the same question for you, Zoe. Um, you know, it's been a long production process and development process for this movie. And I wondered um, what drew you to it and why you wanted to work on it. Um, well, I met I met Bora like 10 years ago um, when she was actually making her short film in Korea she, when, when she was in grad school in New York and she came out to Korea to make her short film, the recorder exam, and that's how we first met. And I ended up working on the film and I ended up producing it. So that was sort of the beginning of our relationship and when Bora went on to make the feature, um, I read early developments of the script and you know the, the fact that it was an expansion of the short film. Um, and like a lot of people who had seen the short, I had also wanted to know what happens to Vinny um, because the short film was based on, on, on the same character of the same name. It was set in 1988. And in that film, Uni is uh, like nine years old. And then this film, House of Hummingbird, takes place five years later and the same character is five years older. So I, I think I felt invested in this character and this story. So I had wanted to be involved. Um, but at the time, like I was at, still in school and I was working on a different project. So like, you know, we had a lot of sort of back and forth, but I had made a lot of headway with, you know, funding and everything. And then I sort of came on board while I was in Korea. Um, but I, I would say just in terms of like why and how I got involved is, is really just sort of being always really invested in, in Bora's work as a filmmaker and like her, like she just sort of, she has a way of really not being afraid of like dig into these emotions, like these, the emotional journey of characters. So I'm yeah, I'm very grateful that I could have been a part of that. <laughs> well, I think uh, you two clearly make an excellent team. I think it's really difficult to make a movie that's this tender, you know? Um, and I think that uh, a lot of filmmakers approach this time in life and some of the story arcs that happen in this movie with a lot more of a sensationalist mm. uh, portrayal. And I really um, deeply appreciated how understated um, the journey was for him. Mm. Um, Thank you. Yeah, great work. I'd love to talk a little bit about um, how the 90s and history are and how time functions in this movie. Um, because it's not, it's not as if in any way that we're being hit over the head with the kind of visual cues of the era, but the movie is like kind of structured around these deeply um, iconic moments in Seoul's history. And so I wondered, um, how time and historical period was um, operating for you, Bora, as you wrote the script and as you sought to um, create the movie? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason that I uh, set the film as uh, 1994 was like there were like, several reasons. First reason was, the easy reason was, um, that was the time that I was in middle school, like the character Uni. Um, and also second reason, the main reason is there was the year of Songsu Bridge Collapse, which happened in in Korea. And there was like really, really painful tragedy. And the next year after Songsu Bridge Collapse, uh, there was Sampung Department Store Collapse too. Sampung, uh, Sampung Department Store is like the, one of the iconic department store in Seoul. And then within the two years, we lost so many people because of that. And that collapse uh, in a row was because of the fact that the Korea built everything so fast because they really wanted to develop everything fast to be a developed country. And that was like a, a several years after 1988 Seoul Olympics. And Seoul Olympic was like really major event for us because 
after and during the Olympics, we are all very like excited about being recognized and like being a big country from the underdeveloped country. And then because of that, like the eagerness to the uh, developed country, we built everything so fast and then the collapse happened. And that was kind of a wake up call for our country to be aware of what it means to be human being and like safety. And it was kind of like growing pain for us. And I see my film as coming of age of Uni, but at the same time, coming of age of my country. So I wanted to bring that era back and also my, my teenager age uh, back too. I guess I always want to um, deal with this era, adolescence era, because we, as an adult, we still carry that sort of unfinished business from the adolescence. And I wanted to, I wanted to make audience to also revisit their own unfinished business, like emotional baggage that they are carrying for the rest of life after, even after they grow up. And I, so I wanted to pair these younger little girls coming of age and countries coming of age because these two factors are the fact that we all have to re reflect and reconsider. And I think a lot of international audiences, they also think about their own country by watching Songs Bridge Collapse event because that sort of tragedy, like national tragedy, always happened to any countries in different form. Like US has this 911, and also Japan has a lot of like uh, earthquake and like a lot of tra national tragedy, big tragedy. And then around that tragedy, we know we kind of like touch on what's human being, how we should live, because that sort of tragedy really, really kind of reconstruct you, you yourself and like really make you think about what's human being. Yeah. Zoe, I can only imagine that producing a movie in a city this big and this busy had deep challenges. <laughs> I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about the process and um, some of the things that were interesting or difficult or um, surprising or exciting about producing uh, this movie um, in this location. Well, the, the pre-production period was like for on and off. It went on for a few years. And I think a lot of the initial location scouting, because I think as you can see in the finished film, the locations play such a huge part in this yeah. in this movie. And of course, when you work on a tiny budget, it's, it's all about the locations. Um, and Bora had already found a lot of, you know, locations and we had an, an amazing team of um, assistant directors who I, I would say like they, they, they did so much for this film. Um, and the team just put so much heart into the process of finding these locations. And the casting was also like a really long journey. Um, I think to find the, the actor to play Unhi, it took like three years. Um, and I think like Bora ended up seeing every actor, female actor in that age range who was an actor in Korea, like all around the country. <laughs> Um, and, and then like started to branch out outside of sort of the norms of like how you would normally cast. But then um, I was there for the first audition of Jihu, luckily, because at the time I was in Korea and like I was just blown away by that performance. Um, and then I think that was one of the <clears throat> really crucial, important like decisions that Bora made for the, the film, the casting of that actor. Um, so I think, yeah, the casting, the locations that they they those things I think took a long time, um, and then in terms of the city itself, I think Bora had wanted to try to film to be sort of truth to the the film the story itself to film in the Gangnam area. Um, so although like Seoul itself is really huge, um, the the team actually focused a lot in that region of Seoul, which was going through major development at the time 
in 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 the nineties. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was a very long process for sure. Zoe is our song an editor for this film. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have questions about that in just a few minutes because the pacing of this movie is one of the things that I think is absolutely stunning and really um, supports so much of the kind of deeply emotional topics that could be like more heavy handed but are really treated um, lightly and uh, elegantly, I would say, in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's a pretty good segue to my next question, which is um, I haven't seen a movie in a long time that does as good a job of portraying this moment in like kind of a teen's romantic awakening. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate um, the characters uh, searching both with a boyfriend and a girlfriend. I think that's like such an amazing and um, true to life like experience for so many people. And um, I just wondered like, uh, it's so pitch perfect, the performances between those three young people. Um, and I wondered like um, how you worked with those young people to create such amazing mm -hmm. interaction. Um, I know a lot of it probably lands on, um, you know, Unhi, but I found the other two actors to be just like, they were all just exceptional in that room. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the three actors are like, not like trained actors. I mean, they've been in like films, uh, but like, they're not like trained in an institution. And I like that because if you if you send your kids after to institution, they act in the same way, and I don't like it. So I our I was actually looking for actor and actress who are very like acting raw and like weird. And I'm glad that we found them. And in terms of Uni main character Uni, where I I would hang out with her like for no reason before film sets. Because to work to work with teenager actors, you really need to build up the trust. And once you build up trust, and like they know you really trust them and like them, then they act really well because they're very in, in uh, intuitive, and the bond between us is very important. So I would just hang out with them. Like sometimes I would go to the cafe and like French and my main actress, Uni, she would come over to my place and she slept over in my place and we would chat and I read tarot cards. So I, I would read tarot cards for her and we would have like nice brunch and dinner and ask questions about us. Like she would ask questions about me and I would ask questions about her, but we didn't talk about film on purpose. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want her to feel like we are working. So we would just literally hang out for no reason, for fun, about for fun and joy, so that we can have good relationship first as human beings. And then everything else is after like it's happening naturally. And we uh, working with the other two actors and actor and actress. Um, I guess I would have some meeting, intimate meetings at least twice or three times before set, although they're like uh, seemingly relatively uh, smaller characters than Uni, main character Uni. Then I, I apply the same uh, method. I would ask questions about them, about their life and what's their concern in their lives. And, and then I try to be really serious and respect them as an adult, as if they're an adult. Because if you have, if you show respect, then they know they're respected and they're heard. And I think that's very important for this little human beings, little human beings, uh, like teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> I am listening to them, yeah. yeah. 
I'm listening to them. Yeah, and then after that, like after that sort of bond uh, happening on set, everything is going in like flow. And even on set, I would ask question like, you know, although I would know the answers, it's so important for a director to ask questions to teenager actors. Like, uh, for example, what do you need in this scene? What do you want the other person to say or do something? I know the answer because I'm director, but like it's important to ask questions to them. But actually, you know what? I'm, I'm wrong. I'm not always right because although I thought I had an answer, sometimes kids actors, teenage actors know better answer than how to modify my answer and then go to like, uh, like try to do something different according to their answer. And through this sort of conversation, they know they're part participating together. And that sort of like uh, feeling that they're in power, I think it's important for us to work together well. Yeah, I think it really comes through that you believe in the agency of young people in mm -hmm. this movie. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really uncommon and I I have worked with a lot of young people and I've been an educator and an arts facilitator for young people for a long time and I just, I hunger for more movies like this for them, you know, where they see their own experiences reflected in ways where they're not always like in these strict archetypes or where they're not always powerless or where they're not always mm -hmm. like focused on one set of problems. Um, so. I just really, really appreciate that you all have made this movie that speaks so well to young people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Zoe, as the editor, can you talk to us about the pacing of this movie? There's some really mm -hmm. elegant construction in here that um, I know one critic, I believe it was um, in the Variety Review, was like, um, you could really miss, it's so subtle, um, some of the elegant construction in this movie, like opening with um, a group of young women and ending with a group of young women. And I just wondered if you wanted to share with us um, a little bit about the logics that you employed when you were making editing choices in this movie mm -hmm. to really keep that um, delicateness intact. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what the, the pacing of the film, um, I mean, I think like initially why Bora reached out to me to, I mean, she suggested that I edit it. And I, this was the first narrative feature film that I edited. So it was a real challenge. And now we look back, we're like, I think that was a little crazy. Why did we decide to do that? Because it was a long process. But I, I think through it, we really learned the material, like really. And, and as in like, we looked at every single take together. You know, I mean, like I, for two months and then the, and then actually we did all of this in Chicago, um, in, in my little apartment. Um, but initially I think the first cut that I did was three and a half hours long. And, you know, I, I, I really like slow cinema. So. <laughs> please, please somebody send me the cut. I, 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 you know, it was much slower and really it took its time. And, and the way that Bora shot the film, she really took her time too. And I think, you know, like a lot of the shots would go on for like another minute after the, the everything was over. And I just wanted to sit there and watch how it ended. Um, but then we decided, of course, we had to cut it down. And I think we had a two hour and 40 minute version and we sent that out to a lot of people had a lot of great um, feedback, but they said we have to get it under two hours. Um, so we ended up trying a two hour cut. We even like brought in an additional editor to see if you know they can try something different to make it faster. Um, but it just, it just didn't work. Like even if the film, everything, all the scenes were in there and everything was shorter, like it just felt like an entirely different movie. And we knew that this, it really needed to take its, its time. Um, and also, as, as you can see in the film, like it has a very episodic structure to it, um, which I think was, was a challenge, but like when you read the script, you don't sense that because it's like emotionally, it's so 
well like constructed um but like a lot of the times when we watched the film when i did a cut we would notice that like because each scene is so self-contained in a way too like how the emotional journey happens within a scene so we had to just figure out how to create that narrative the emotional arc of our main character all the way throughout the film so it was always just constantly for us asking in each and every moment like what is in he feeling right now and how does that play a part in the entire emotional arc of the story um and and honestly like there was just so much good material that we we had a really hard time throwing things out and i remember like even until the very last minute we had a we decided to take out a cut a scene and then like three days before i think our like world premiere bora was like i think we have to put that back in and we have to like remake the dcp and everything <laughs> If you have to, you have to, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. But I, I truly think that like a lot of people, you know, we, we do think it is it is a long film, but I, I think it is really the best version that it can be and it needs to be that length, you know, even if it's, and I, and I think that it does reward you for that at the end, I, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a couple more questions, but anyone who's watching in the audience, please do feel free to submit some of your own questions if you would like. Um, don't be shy. Um, something else that I think is super tricky to handle that you guys navigated so, so beautifully um, is the portrayal of violence. It, in moments, feels um, unflinching and yet completely mundane. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that uh, the characters react and respond and are, you know, kind of get to a violent place feels really uh, deeply embedded, like within the family structure and it feels really meaningful. And it's also um, scary and kind of unspectacular at the same time. And so, um, I, and it also really invokes some relationships around gender that I think are super interesting. Um, so I wondered if you guys have had any feedback around that or if that had been uh, meaningful to anyone in hearing about the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you for the comments because that was exactly my intention to, when it comes to depicting violence because I didn't want to like exhibit violence in a spectacular way. Um, like a lot of male directors do. Um, that wasn't my interest at all because I think violence happens in our daily lives. And sometimes we're not even aware that it was violent. But if we look back into our past, there was always violence every day's life. And we didn't really recognize because back then in the past, there was no more. And I think in the 90s, that was actually no more, no more. Like, Uni's family was way no more in that era. And I think that that family being no more in that era is very, very, I think, of no more, I think. And I wanted to depict that sort of like mundane violence in a kind of like calm way so that we can really focus on the truth and then what is the dynamic in that situation because if you put so much like you know adding some like that uh, spectacle to the violence then you kind of lose the truth you lose the sight because it's so sensational and so i try my best to avoid that sort of spectacle and i think a lot of films uh, which are dealing with like sensational violence like a rape or like like hitting and they, they show hitting and killing without really thinking about what can affect on the audiences and I didn't want to show it directly so that there's a scene Winnie is bitten by her brother but I didn't show it and I just showed it the living room and then you can just hear the sound but that's more I think painful because you can imagine but you don't have to see it that was my intention and i think a lot of audiences 
around the world, they were deeply moved by the way that I depicted the violence because that sort of violence and gender inequality is everywhere in, in, in like, I did, I did think it's a global issue. And I remember when I showed House of Hummingbird in Spain, there was a one female audience, she said, you know, Unhi was me. I think all women are Unhi and I can relate it to her. That was my past, something like that. And like, I, I was very touched because a lot of women who went, who had to went through that sort of like gender issue in their own country, they can see themselves through the character Uni, and that was also my intention. But in in Korea, especially because it was so weird, uh, a lot of audiences told me that the film felt like documentary, and because the the the, the situation that I dealt with was so weird to them, and some audiences for me they even felt like pain, although there's the violence isn't depicted uh, like a like like spectacular, but still it was too painful to watch it. So they they had tough top time sometimes to watch this sort of some sort of scene when yeah. he is beaten and bullied by others. Yeah. But my also another attention uh, intention about violence is that I didn't want to depict father and brother as mean, evilish characters because they're also human beings. And I wanted to capture that. That's like a vicious circle of violence and they're also hurt. They, these two people are also hurt. They have this big trauma in themselves and they that's why they behave that way. And then there are scenes that they, they are crying for 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 like out of nowhere, and then to for to, uh, showing that sort of scenes of their uh, of them, like I wanted to depict that they are also human beings, but I didn't want to like justify their right. Their behaviors are totally wrong, but I wanted to show that their complexity as a creator. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well done. I think another thing that happens for me is that um, the violence of saying something harsh feels more in a spectrum with mm -hmm. physical violence, which I think is like a really important insight for people right. who've had that experience. Mm -hmm. um, so great job, great job, you guys. Um, we have two questions from the audience. Uh, our first one is from Vincent Gilios and Bora or Zoe, do you follow your instinct and that will result in your style? Or do you try to build your own style consciously? So it's hmm. a bit of an existential question. Let's <laughs> Great question, Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> Zoe, you want to go first? Uh, when you edit. I think I think it's instinct, really. I think I think oftentimes you try to build your style, but I, I I think that it's, it's tough. Yeah. I hope that I hope that it goes both ways, though. I hope that the instinct is the style that I want to <laughs> to build. Yeah. 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 I, I feel the same way. I think it's the mixture of the two instinct and like building your style, because on set, I would make like instinct uh, decision, like when every when something like goes wrong, you have to make instant decision on set. But then the instant decision comes from, you know, a lot of effort and preparation. So if you build like, like very concrete storyboards and you know what you are going to do for the day of the shoot, and you have so many, so many preparation, then the instinct comes. Because when when something goes well wrong, then the, the the other plan B comes naturally. That's instinct, I think. But that instinct comes after the pre preparation, and like along with the mm -hmm. preparation. Because if you don't have any preparation, any effort before, then the instinct never comes. So I would say that's both way because of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I want to, we have a couple more questions, but I want to share this comment from the audience with you both first. Um, Julia says, thank you both for sharing this precious film. I'm a young documentary filmmaker and Korean woman. And this conversation is so lovely and helpful. So thanks. Thank you. It's working, you guys, this movie is working. Um, <laughs> Another question from the audience. Uh, how long did it take to do principal production? Actual production. 30, 34 days, I think. 30, 33 30, days, 34 days, 32 30. days, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that seems crazy fast. Was it crazy fast? <laughs> well, actually, that was like long shooting days compared to another independent film. And our budget was, don't surprise. Don't get too surprised. Uh, it's under the three hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that thirty-two days was stretched over like six weeks or something, six to seven weeks, I think. Yeah. Great. Um. Always, always good to know these details for other filmmakers. Always good to know. Um, question from the audience. How do you handle post-production audio and color? Did you have regular collaborators or work with new ones for the first time on this film? I see. Oh, I I have regular collaborators. I, I made a short film, The Recorder Exam, which is like a pre-quart to House of Hummingbird. And I've been working with him for for many films and he was uh he was a uh, um like he was working for the the film burning and burning by Lee Chang Dong and he would like work for many many great Korean films and I I really like him because he's very subtle and the way he deals with like naturalistic sound uh like I like I really like it so we also like try to put very natural ambience uh, throughout the film and then like some scene when we had to do like we would make uh, other like um, like we would make, put like some other sound for some sort of effect like we like uh, carefully uh, try to do some like sound design like based on the emotional arc yeah and he's a, he's a very good collaborator yeah great um, more audience, more audience questions. Um, Zoe and Boris, you seem to have a strong, instinctive working relationship. Do you all work together on projects often? And what are you each on working individually? Also, uh, <laughs> you, I, I, I think you might. I think you guys might work together a lot. Um, and then the, there's a comment here. Zoe has such a distinctive voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, you want to go first? Are they working on other projects together? Ah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Oh, the 10 months of editing with Joy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a very good working relationship, but we also fight a lot. And it's, yeah. Very, yeah, it's very tiring. <laughs> Every time we work together, we we are became kind of enemies. <laughs> I'm glad yeah, yeah. <laughs> forgave me and <laughs> be my friend still. <laughs> <laughs> We've okay. seen the best and the worst of each other, so yeah. you know. But I think it says a lot that we can still like remain friends. Yeah. after going through so much um and i yeah hopefully you know we are, right now we're working on separate things at the moment um but we'll see we'll see what is in the horizon there might be who knows <laughs> i think joey zoe and i we fought a lot and we had so many deep deep intense conversation but i think for a good working relationship it's so important for you to really respect the other person and I think when even when I really hated her, like I knew that she's a good person, and I really respect her, and I I just love her like as a person. That's really important because you know you are fighting with someone who's worth to fight with. You don't want to fight with somebody who you don't even want like. You know what I'm saying? So I would say 
pick a person, pick a collaborator you can really like as a person. Then even you fight with the person, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like lots of really productive, creative relationships. <laughs> I know. It really does. Doesn't it? I mean, I think I'd, I've definitely had collaborators that I like am in intense collaboration with and then like wander away for a few years and like find myself back in intense collaborations with them. And I think that that, that seems like a natural process to me. Um, this is leading to an, um, another audience question. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring filmmakers overcoming self-doubt? Hmm. Zoe, you wanna go first? I don't know. I think I think I I think you should speak to that. I I I I, I think I struggle with self doubt too. Always, yeah, all the time, and I, it's still something I wonder about. I, I I struggle with at times. Yeah. Even though you both have this gorgeous feature behind you, I mean, it seems like such a real accomplishment that it would put some confidence in the bank. You know. So you're mm -hmm. done? Oh. oh no no no! Oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Go ahead, go ahead. You finish first. I think it's like I think every project, it's every project still brings uncertainties, and I think it's, and I think somebody said that you know you always have to confront what you fear the most, right? And there's a reason why you fear something, and. I, I I try to remember that, but I still struggle with it. Yeah. So I please for our suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a really good question because that question was the like sole only question that I dealt with for like seven years. Uh, it took us seven years to finish this film, and that was really emotional, hard an intense journey as a filmmaker because you know sometimes you you get lost uh, having this fear that you might not be able to finish this film and I was really sometimes depressed but I would say um, trust your instinct and trust yourself and I remember when I finished my first draft for uh, first draft and last scene of the first draft I was in cafe working with the screenplay and I wrote this last sentence of the first draft and I knew there was like very, very warm and deep emotion rising from my heart and I cried and it was public space so I cried like this. <laughs> I remember I was so touched by my own screenplay. I believed in the screenplay and I knew that this is something that I really want to dig into and explore even for many years. I knew that at the moment, this is right. I'm going well. And that instinct and that like strong emotion that I felt at the day of first draft, uh, the day of uh, when I wrote, uh, uh, when I finished my first draft, that emotion came throughout the seven years of journey. And that strong belief uh, came with the journey. And, and also I remember uh, very good advice from my father. And when I was like really, really scared and nervous about like not being able to make this film before the film set, film should begin, um, there was a time that I felt the most anxious. And I called my father and I told him like, Father, Daddy, I'm, I'm really scared and anxious. And I really want to make this film well, but I'm very nervous and scared. And my father replied, Cora, you are very fortunate. Not everyone can do work for something, for a broad project that you make that scared. Yeah. It's challenging project. That means you are in love with it. And it's worth to try. Since you are in love with the project, that's why you are very nervous because you really love it and you want to do it well. So you are very fortunate. And I really love the advice from my father. 
and it was really well said. And so every time I felt anxious and nervous when I was shooting the film, I was reminded of my father's advice. Okay, I'm nervous because I really love this. Does, does it make sense? Yeah. That's some amazing advice. <laughs> That's really good advice, Dad, <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening. Um, so I think we have time for one more. This question comes from Eleanor Cho. I have always been interested in working in South Korea's film industry, and I was wondering what the biggest differences are between filmmaking in the US and in South Korea. So I think it's for your question. I mean, I, I, I think for an independent film, it's you, you faced always the similar challenges that you have to work with very little and you have to struggle for resources. And I think that is not so different. Um, I, I, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I mean, I think, I think, I, I think about the similarities so much more than, more than the differences. I think like in terms of the funding structure, it's a little different there. Are, I mean, we, the House of Hummingbird was mostly made on grant money. Um, that's I think more difficult to do in the US. And I think the money goes a little further in Korea. Like you can make something of this scale um, for less. And I think it would have been more difficult to do something like that in this in the US. Um, but in terms of actual production, how you put a team together, how you have crew working together, how you have certain you know rules around production, um, it's it's I, I don't think there are major differences. And and, and you know things have changed in the in Korea as well. Um, and Bora has has I think longer experience working in Korea than I have. But like, I think there are more sort of labor laws now that protect crew in Korea now that they're used to not be so. So, you know, you would have people working like seven days a week for like 20 hours a day. Um, but things have improved vastly, not much, much more. So, mm -hmm. I think Korea is so dynamic <laughs> in many, many ways. <laughs> Mm -hmm. A lot of people are depressed and a lot of people are complaining a lot for my country and we have this like really messed up gender issue and I yeah. think we are all complaining but also we love our country in a very complex way and I think that sort of struggle, daily struggles and anger <laughs> kind of make, make us to make create some some art new art because we need some outlet to express ourselves <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. well i can't thank you enough bora and zoe for being with us and congrats on such an amazing and beautiful movie um, and i want to thank everybody for tuning in with us and i hope everybody stays safe and do tell your friends to go see House of Hummingbird in virtual theaters now, right? Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Right. Um, thank you all. Please have a lovely evening. You thank too. You. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.